Hello, and on behalf of VMUG, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast. What's an Enterprise Cloud? Presented by AJ Kuftik, Principal Technologist, Expedient. Thank you for participating in today's webcast and for your continued support in the global VMUG program. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items to go over. First, today's webcast will be recorded and available for you on demand. You will receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link, so keep an eye out for that. Second, a Q&A session will follow today's presentation. All questions will need to be entered in the question window near the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. Third, there will be a short online evaluation that pops up as you exit the webcast. Please make sure to take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. All opt-in attendees from today's webcast will be entered into a raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Expedient will email the winner directly following the webcast today, so good luck. All right, let's get started. AJ, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, uh, thanks Julie for the introduction. Hi, my name is AJ Koftik. I'm Principal Technologist for Expedient. Um, today we're gonna to talk about Enterprise Cloud and how there are different kinds of clouds. Um, but first, just a quick um, briefer on Expedient. Uh, we were founded in 2001. Uh, we started as a co-location company and moved into managed, service, uh, managed services and cloud. Uh, we have cloud locations in US East, Central and West. We just opened our West market at the end of 2019. Uh, we have international cloud deployments on customer sites in Australia, Germany, and Canada. So if our cloud doesn't, if our cloud locations don't work with you, we can work with you on your cloud location. Uh, we were recognized by Gartner for DR as a service for the last three years. Uh, we are a VMware cloud partner and or VMware cloud provider and have been since 2007, since the inception of the program. Um, that allows us to provide VMware cloud solutions at scale. Uh, we have 20,000 plus uh, virtual machines running on our platform, so we've been able to run uh, VMware platforms at scale for a very long time. And we're also a Zerto, Zerto Platinum partner. So before I get into cloud, I want to talk about work. Um, and I want to talk about the different kinds of work. Um, and how that kind of fits into how we handle our, act, our use of our time. So first we have business projects. These are the things that are driving revenue uh, that the business is coming to you as IT and asking to assist to help provide newer, pro newer abilities to the business. So we want to uh, add a new feature to our website to allow bulk ordering, or we want to use new analytics to figure out better data about our customers, to advertise to them better. These are business projects that allow uh, customers to actually get better services and drive more revenue into the business. We also have internal projects. So these are the things that we do as IT to allow uh, our resiliency to improve. So if we know that, hey, this storage array keeps failing, uh, we're gonna move maybe from a three-tier architecture to a hyper-converged infrastructure so that we can still provide all the storage, but separate out the workload a little bit further. Or we're going to have um, a self-service portal and automate the delivery of our resources so that our developers or our end users can get the things that they want in a faster time, in a faster time and faster uh, fashion. Third, we have unplanned work. These are the things that go bump in the night. These are the things that go boom. Um, unplanned work is not predictable, right? That's what makes it unplanned. Um, but we can mitigate unplanned work through things like internal projects, right? We can say, hey, this storage array keeps failing, so we're going to mitigate the unplanned work that we have from array failures to uh, architecture changes or we <clears throat> implement a code change to, to fix those sorts of things. Unplanned work can also be caused by uh, humans. So a man with a backhoe tears up a fiber line, now you're offline, or you know somebody runs the wrong commands. That's all work that you have to do that's unplanned. And we try our best to mitigate it, but it only works so far. And finally, we have planned work. And planned work is all the stuff that we as IT do there's 123 people on this call and I'm pretty sure every single one of us has to do unplanned work to keep those lights on, 
right? How do we do our hardware refreshes? How do we handle patching? How much time do we spend doing patching and migrations of resources for new pieces of hardware? How do I make sure that when the business projects and internal projects come want to use our platform, they want to go do those things? So how do we use that? That's the, the business projects and the internal projects, that's high value work. This is where we think our use is. This is where we want to be as IT staff. On the bottom, we have low value work. And these are the things that, while it keeps the lights on, it's not terribly uh, exciting to the business. It doesn't really drive any value to them or they don't really see the value in it because it's, it's you know, more or less table stakes work, right? It's not necessarily skilled. So how does that work with cloud, right? We have all of our current responsibilities. I still have to keep the lights on. I still have to do all that planned work. But now because our CIO has gone and talked to some friends or our CFO or our CEO is talking to friends, they're now seeing cloud. They're seeing the advertising for cloud. They're seeing things like AWS providing statistics on uh, baseball. And they're trying to figure out how do they use those sorts of things. It's not just an IT only knowledge base. So we have our current responsibilities and all of the vendors and control that we have while needing to be more agile and faster to market. And really what it ends up, you end up, you end up feeling like this, right? You end up feeling like you're juggling things and that you're trying to keep all these balls in the air. You're trying to keep all of your projects going. You're trying to keep all this work going. You're not really sure how, right? So what we have to do is we have to make time. Right? It's the one resource that no one has that you can't make more of. You can go request more funding. You can go get more hardware, but you can't make more time. Right? So let's start with a couple of the things that eat our time. Right? Host patching. So ESX host patching, vCenter patching, NSX patching, anything in the, v, the VMware stack, but also our application stack, our middleware stack, our operating systems, all of this patching is, are things that we do to maintain the security and the availability of the platform, but eat a ton of time that isn't being spent on maybe more higher value things. There's capacity management. So we have our overall capacity and us being able to manage our, the resources that we're able to provide back to the business. And because we have to manage all this capacity, that takes a lot of time. How do I make sure that I have the resources so that when maybe an analytics project that comes on board and wants to eat all of those resources, how do I backfill that? And all of the time spent trying to figure all of that out. In addition to the hardware refreshes, right? So we have every three years, four years, we're gonna replace all of our hardware. Or we're gonna replace bits and pieces of that hardware. How do I make sure that I'm driving forward and making sure that I'm not leaving any hardware behind and I'm also not overspending and over allocating resources that I'm never gonna end up using? Oh, and by the way, you still have all of your project work. All of this stuff eats up time and it makes you feel like you're, you know, waist deep in quicksand. You know, everything's fine, you're smiling, everybody's great, but you're still waist deep in quicksand. You can't make any movement. You're not making any progress. So how do we fix that? How do we get out of the quicksand? <clears throat> we find a balance, we strike a balance here. So from an on-premises environment, we have our existing skill set, right? All of us here have been doing VMware things for the better part of a decade now. And even if you're new to the platform, you've probably been doing it for a few years. And our apps haven't changed, right? These, th when businesses bring in applications, they don't bring them in for six months or a year, they bring them in for four, six, 10 years to make sure that they get the maximum value out of that. Because by the time they get to the point of everybody in the business using that application or that, that part of the organization is using it, it's been a year and a half and it takes them time to continue ramping that up. And then it becomes buried in their business processes. So these applications aren't changing. The problem with on-premises is that you have no agility. You can't handle when the analytics platform comes to you and says, we want to build this gigantic platform and you don't have the resources sitting on the shelf. And that's largely due to the fact that you on-premises is driven by CapEx. And even if you lease, you still have that hardware for three to four years. And that takes all of your agility away and puts it into these three to four year packages. And so if you want to go do something, you have to have the overwhelming business case to go do it versus saying, I just need some resources to, to try something. 
And that on-premises environment is very manually driven, right? Even if you've automated certain things, like maybe your operating system deployment, or you've you know, got customization specs and templates, you're still manually going in and clicking them. You still have all the administrative overhead of getting a server. It's all still very, it's still all still a very manual process. On the opposite side with hyperscale, we have a completely new skill set, new nomenclature, new syntax, new functions, new knowledge that has to go be learned. And that's a big uplift, especially from an on-premises world where you're still thinking about all the very, you know, deep, the very deep level, like I really care about the CPU types, or I care about the D, I care about, you know, DDR3 versus DDR4. When you start to move into the hyperscale clouds, you don't get to think about that at all. And you have to focus on all the individual services that they offer, and there are a lot of them. And because they're focused on services and applications, your existing applications don't necessarily translate over as well as they could or should, right? You're looking at things like app refactoring to try and get your applications to fit properly in a hyperscale cloud. You can pick them up and run them, but it's gonna cost you a lot of money because you're not thinking about the month to month cost of those things and how they operate. You're focused on just, I bring the application up and I can talk to it. And then your eyes bug out of your head when you get the first bill. What cloud really brings to the table though is that agility and that, that elasticity. I wanna be able to spin things up and spin things down. Uh, if anybody here is, works for a business that's, you know, sometimes seasonal, things like uh, health insurance, retail, um, government work too, uh, they can all be very seasonal. And when you have to size for the big high level watermark, you're sitting there in June saying, well, I don't have anything going on right now and I've got all these additional resources, but I can't use them because I need to make sure they're available for October or January or November or wherever your seasonal uh, mark is. And it's tough, it's tough to get to gain that agility. And this is all driven by having monthly OPEX. Cloud is a multi-tenant platform. So the ability for them to be able to just hand you resources month to month is a lot easier than you trying to buy all those, trying to buy all those resources and build them all yourself. And you can spin them up and spin them down. So when the analytics team comes in and says, hey, we wanna do this. You can spin them up those resources they pay for those resources, they use them and they say, actually, this isn't doing what we want it to do. We want to try something else. And you say, okay, fine, we'll shut all that down. And you're not sitting there holding the bag on hardware for the next three to four years or trying to, trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And they're also API driven, right? So I don't have to worry about, you know, a, a manual ticketing process to go click a bunch of buttons to get a server. I can use an API to drive all of the resources and pull them into and make my applications off of, the pro off of the platforms and products of those clouds. But there feels like there's a balance here in the middle, right? Now, what if I could do this? I could bring the existing skill set and my applications from on-premises, but give them the elasticity and agility and a monthly OPEX and a full-fronted API to be able to drive new changes to my application set while maintaining my present. That's what an enterprise cloud is. So an enterprise cloud sits in the middle of these two. So why Expedience Enterprise Cloud? We bring your things over. We bring your applications over. We can bring your networks over. Um, that data comes over as well. So you don't have to try and make it fit into these sorts of platforms. We have a full VMware stack. So if you're running vSphere on-prem, we're vSphere on our side as well. So there's no changes to your application. It's simply a migration. All of our pools, all of our resources are driven through pools. So when you come on and you say, I need 100 CPUs and 500 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage, those are the resources you pay for. You don't have to pay for the N plus one or I need to have 20% year over year growth and I actually need to have two terabytes of RAM in my hardware so that I can grow into it. You pay for those resources and when you need more, we can provision them to you in days instead of months or even hours instead of days. So by doing that, it makes it so that everything is consumption-based and you have that flexibility and agility that you're looking for without having to completely upend those applications. We can also leverage our staff, our delivery and operations staff, to help you do your migrations and support your applications. But at the same time, you don't have to completely relearn everything. You can bring your skill set. Everything here is VMware-based. So if you can write an NSX rule on-premises, you can write an NSX rule on our platform. And as you start to move forward and you want to go do more cloud-driven things, more API-driven things, 
we have a full front, uh, we have a full REST API on our front end. We have full API documentation, and we're, we're in the process of building our Kubernetes platform out so that you can bring your containers as well. Or if you're looking to start working with containers, building on top of this and sitting it right next to your VMs and your existing hardware in our co-location space can help your past, present, and future all sit together. So remember we were making time, right? So what EEC does is has a whole bunch of vSphere hosts that we maintain for you. So your host patching goes away. And from a resource standpoint, you're focused on the resources you're actually using and not trying to have to plan ahead for all of these additional resources that you may or may not need. So your capacity management goes away. And then because we're maintaining all the hardware, we're taking care of, the, of keeping up with our partners at Intel and our partners at Dell, so you don't have to worry about hardware refreshes. So all that's left is you focusing on your project work. So you go from being waist deep in quicksand to standing on top of the mountain and you're looking down at the clouds. It's a much easier build and a much easier way to maintain your platform. But slides are fun. But let's talk about a demo. Let's actually get into this, right? So we start with our front, with our front end. We have uh, our, uh, our platform can integrate with your customer Active Directory. So you don't have to worry about setting up your own accounts and how are you gonna manage them and all of that life cycle. You can connect your AD to our platform and you're still handling all the life cycle and management of those accounts. So if somebody leaves the company, you disable their account, they've just been disabled from Expedia Enterprise Cloud as well. So if I can find my mouse somewhere here. There it is. So I'm gonna type in my password. And we have two-factor authentication on our platform. Using the VMware Verify app, I just got the, the prompt on my phone, so I just approved it. And we're gonna go ahead and log in. So this is our first view. These are our virtual data centers. So our data center, our 701 data center is in Indianapolis. <clears throat> and our ACM data center is in Pittsburgh. So we have the capability to link these two together. We have a 100 gig backbone between all of our data centers. So we're capable of driving huge throughput between them and you can link them together so that you can have an active active data center set up or an active standby data center uh, set up. So we're gonna go down to administration and I'm gonna take a look at our roles. So in here we have all of our SAML accounts that are, those are all our AD accounts. You can also create local accounts if you want to, maybe service accounts. We also have our roles. So we have out of the box roles. So we have full admin rights, read only rights and certain granular rights. But let's say you had an operations group. And inside of that operations group, you wanted to give them maybe read only rights. And those read only rights are for you know, uh, your help desk. Your help desk can log in and see, oh, hey, this VM is down, or hey, this VM is resetting, or something's not right here, I see this isn't right, and they can start to escalate. Or let's say you don't wanna give them full read write, full read write capability, you wanna give them just some capabilities, you can grant them things like edit VM CPU, edit hard disk, edit network, but not give them the ability to delete the VM. So they have the ability to make small changes without making overall uh, changes to the platform or cause an outage because of human error. <clears throat> so when we go back in, we're gonna go down to our libraries. So we offer two different ways of handling the libraries. We have our EEC templates, which are at the top. Those are our templates that we provide out to you. So we have Windows Server 2012, 2016, and 2019. Um, those are base Windows VMs. They are running uh, VMware tools and latest patches, and that's it. So if you wanna use those, you can. There's no charge for using them. You just get charged for the use of the resources uh, once it's deployed. We also have the ability to upload our own templates. So if you have your own Windows uh, OVA or your own Windows template or your own RHEL template or CentOS template, you can take those create an OVA file and upload it and not have to modify anything, that template just comes over. So like that AJKWP that we'll be deploying here in a second, that's a Bitnami instance. Uh, Bitnami is a VMware acquisition that has more or less pre-built instances of things like WordPress, LAMP stacks, those sorts of things. So that's a WordPress instance that is pre-built. I took the OVA and I uploaded it and that's all I had to do. From our data center groups, we can see that 701 and ACM are linked together and they have common egress points. 
So I can go in and look at the network topology and I can fail over my egress points from one data center to another. There's no contacting of our help desk. There's no contacting of our operations staff. You can just go in and do this. This this, uh, this plays into our push button DR. This plays into uh, a number of other network services that, we're cap that we can offer uh, on top of this. One of the other things is that we can stretch layer two. Uh, so we have our, uh, this 10.181.97 network that exists in both the 701 and ACM data center. So again, as part of our disaster recovery, we can do that full network failover uh, instead of just, you got to bring that VM over and shut networks down and routing down on the other side and do some DNS changes. We just fail it over and everything works. <clears throat> so if we go back into our libraries, we're going to go down to our WordPress template here. And I'm going to create a V app. So this is in essence deploying from template. Uh, there's a different way to deploy from template. You can create a V app that has multiple VMs inside of it. So if you want to have something that has maybe two web servers, an app server, and a, data and a database server inside of it and create that as a V app because you deploy that multiple times, uh, maybe a per customer sort of deployment, you can create that V app and just deploy it that way. Or you can have single, app, single VM V apps. So we're going to give this a name. And we're gonna set the lease on this to never expire. You can also set this to run a set number of hours or a set number of days. Uh, so that's part of that flexibility and elasticity. I have the ability to deploy to either 701 or ACM here. Um, when we, in, in our environment, everything is one view. There is no picker to go to a different data center or a different region. Everything is inside of one view. So we can pick our ACM data center we can pick our storage policy. This is all sitting on top of vSAN. We can hit next. From our network standpoint here, we can bring in your networks. So in our world, uh, we, these are all networks that we've created, but we can also bring your IP ranges in, and that's something our delivery and operations team work with you on, on how to bring those over so that you don't have to re-IP everything. There's no changes to your IP. You don't have to redeploy everything. It's a migration. It comes right up. So we're going to pick this network. Um, you have DHCP, you also have a static IP option and an IP pool option. So there's native uh, IP address management with IP pools, um, but there's different options. Some people still like setting static IPs. I'm taking DHCP in this instance. So we also have customizing the hardware. So this is the same sort of concept as, that you have in your on-premises vCenter, but you also have it inside of vCloud Director. So I can change the number of virtual CPUs. I can give this four CPUs, eight CPUs. There's no t-shirt sizes in here. So I can pick whatever set of, whatever amount of RAM I want to in here. I could give this WordPress box 100 gigs of RAM if I want to, or a terabyte of RAM. Um, that would be absurd for a WordPress instance, but I can. So I'm able to build this VM with, you know, two gigs of RAM and a 15 gig a hard disk, but I can change these options to be whatever I want to. You're not hard coded to any sort of sizing. There's no small, medium, large instance. Go in and we'll click finish. And that will start to deploy. So we'll go back into our data centers and I'm gonna pick our ACM data center. And I can see our virtual machine list here. So. This should look very familiar to pretty much anybody who's ever looked at vCenter, right? This is our list of VMs and how we connect to all of them and what resources they're using, how many CPUs they have. <clears throat> but you can also access a number of the other functions to those VMs. So I can power on, power off, reset, take snapshots, open the console. All of those things are still available to you. We're not hiding any of these things from you. These are now all available to you. So again, you're still bringing over that same vSphere knowledge. When you wanna go do something, you know where to go do it. If we take a look at our networks, these are all the networks that we've created. So we have our cross VDC, those are our stretch layer two networks. I also have routed networks. So these are maybe single side networks. Maybe I wanna have a different you know, layer two, layer three network out of my ACM data center than I do on my 701 network. Uh, we also have isolated ones. So if you have, say you want to quarantine a VM because you detected malware, you can do that in here. Or you have, say, a cluster and you want the cluster to be able to talk to each other um, without talking over any other, uh, any other networks, you can do that here as well. So if you want a direct connection between them, you can use an isolated network. When we go into our edge, 
uh, our edge is deployed per tenant. So there's your network settings or your network settings are not going to affect anyone else's. Uh, when we configure these services, we have things like our <clears throat> top level firewall. So this is our outbound firewall for this edge. So we have the capability to do things like protect going north or going outbound or coming inbound. So like uh, rule four and five, there are cohesity platform. We can allow our VMs to get to the, our cohesity platform and allow cohesity to get in um, so that we can do all of the backups and, and data protection that go along with that. You're fully capable of controlling these rules. So if you wanna change them, you wanna move them up and down, you wanna turn on logging, that is all your capability to do so. We also have DHCP. So if you don't wanna bring your own infrastructure, you can use ours, you can turn up the service and it sits on that IP range and listens for, D, or for DHCP requests and can hand those out. So there's a way for us to give you deeper networking level services than just bring your networks and hope for the best. If you have an existing DHCP infrastructure, like say Infoblox, you can set up DHCP relays and point that over and maintain your existing IPAM, your existing DHCP, so you don't have to completely redo everything just because we offer it. We also have our load balancer. So we're capable of offering uh, local load balancing to each of those data centers. So I can do things like have two web servers and stand up a load balancer, all software defined, uh, to allow those through, do full app profile service monitoring, so it's not just pain based, um, and deliver that all through NSX without having, again, to interact with uh, any teams. You can still do all of these things yourselves. Or these are all fronted by the API as well. So if you want to go in and have your developers spin up your spin up a V app and also all of their NSX rules, so you're getting security directly out of the box, NSX firewalls, load balancers, all of that can be delivered through their automation and their infrastructure as code without having to come in here and click a bunch of buttons. So let's go take a look at our V app. And there it is. There's our there's our new V app. <clears throat> so uh, this demo this demo V app has been deployed. Uh, deploy stopped by default, so that's fine. Um, we hit power on. So this is going to go turn on that VM. And if we go in, we can see the VM itself. If we had multiple VMs as part of this uh, V app, they would all be in here, and I could scroll through that list. So in here, we can see all of the options that are available to manage this VM. So I still have power on, power off, reset, suspend, install VMware tools, and just install media. I have all of the same capabilities. So when you're looking at this, this isn't like a completely new world. These are all the same things that you would do inside of vCenter without having to see exactly what host it's on and exactly what storage it's on. It's all being managed on the back end. So we're gonna launch the web console and we open this up. We watch our VM boot and we can see that it grabbed its own IP address of 97.105. And if I go over here, I can open up this tab, drop in that IP address, and there's my WordPress site, right? Simple as that. But now that I have this deployed, let's go take a look at how we would monitor a VM. So now I log in and I can go to our VROPS platform. So our VROPS platform is still part of this portal. I haven't left the portal and I'm not going to because it's all part of this. So I can go into my organization overview and I can see all of the capacity that I have available and all the VMs that I have that are running. So I can see that I have 33 VMs running, 49 total VMs. So we have some things shut down in here, um, but all of my resources and what I'm allowed to have. So those limits, the gray lines, that's what I've been uh, uh, authorized uh, through my contract to have. If I dive into the V the V apps themselves, I'll pick, let's pick this Ubuntu one. This is a VM that I deployed a few weeks ago. And I can go in and I can see my CPU usage. I can see all of the charts, throughput, memory, network information, the same way that I could see them on-prem. And if I were to go into this, this metric selector on the left, I could dive deeper into those stats and see things like CPU ready times, uh, network packet drops, Anything, all the troubleshooting steps that you would previously want to do on-prem, they're all still available here. So you can dive deep into the performance uh, through our VROPS platform. But, you know, I did, I did deploy a WordPress box. And my security team is probably pretty mad that I deployed a web server. And I should probably go look at the firewall rules for that and make sure that they're all set up properly. 
So in here, in our security services, we have full access to the distributed firewall. So I can see all of my rules. I have default allow rules. I can set up a default deny rule. We can block ping. We can set things up with security groups. So all of the things that you would do inside of NSX on premises, you can have access to in here. So this web server is sitting in the web server security group. And that's, man that's managed by these two security tags, the Linux web server tag and the Windows web server tag. So if I go edit this Linux web server tag, and I type in Bitnami, and I go down and I pick my VM and I move that over, and I hit keep, now this tag has been applied to this VM. And I don't have to worry about where do I go set this rule up? What's the name of that VM? I just tag it and I'm good. And if I make any changes with that security group, those firewall rules continue to apply and I don't have to manually manage them. So when I go to ping this, obviously we're not pinging. So why are we not pinging? Oh, because I have a block ping rule sitting there. And you know, as nice as our security team is and we wanna make sure that things are blocked, while I need to troubleshoot this to make sure that the website comes up and is available to everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move that down and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring allow ping up. So right now, the only things that can get to this VM are HTTPS, HTTP, and ping, and that's it. So when I hit apply, those changes go in, the firewall rules apply, and we start to get our pings again. That's our enterprise cloud. So all the capabilities that you expect from your on-premises environment, that's what you're getting in here. So when we look at this, our cloud is built on top of smart hardware, right? We have vSphere HA on the bottom. This is still vSphere on the bottom. So you're only paying for one virtual instance. If we need to do maintenance, your VM gets vMotion. If we, if we have a hardware failure, your VM reboots. So we don't have to worry about, you know, how do I build this out? On the, on the right there, that's a hyperscale cloud design. I have two VMs, one of them active, one of them standby. I have an elastic IP, so my VMs don't, so my users know how to get to that application. I have to reattach my storage in the event of a failure. I have to handle my snapshots to an S3 bucket. There's just a lot of different, a lot of different challenges that go into that, and a lot of a lot of additional complexity that happened there. And so for us, we want to make sure that this is as simple as possible. When you move your applications, you know that they've moved and they're successful. We have 12 enterprise cloud points of delivery. So we have, uh, our, we have our data centers in Boston and Phoenix at the far ends. And then we have our central clusters of Memphis, Indy, Columbus, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Baltimore. Um, this allows us to have nationwide capability and different availability zones so that if you put your things in Boston and Memphis, there are very few things in this world that are going to affect both of them. Um, so you can spread your workloads out. You can make sure that you have availability to your applications along inside of different, um, inside of those different markets. We also have connections into our hyperscaler. So let's say you do want to go down the hyperscale route because you want to use something like Amazon RDS or Azure Data Lakes, something like that. We have low latency, high speed connectivity to those. So we can connect you from our data centers to them without having to jump through running new circuits or different VPN tunnels or different hardware in order to do that. It's right there and available. So if we look at building out our stack, our base platform is vSphere. So everything that you run on-prem, vSphere HA, vMotion, DRS, those are all running on our platform. So you know how, the, how your VM is going to perform. Our, plat our storage platform is VMware vSAN. So we're able to build a big pool of storage. And when we build that big pool of storage, it's been allocated out by the amount of resources and not by what array it's on. We don't have to worry about maintaining different storage arrays and taking those outages and so on and so forth. We have one big pool of resources to give you the scale you need. Our network platform is based on NSX. So that's what powers all the distributed firewall work I just did, the DHCP, the load balancers, the top level firewall, the stretching of layer two, all of that is done through NSX. And that gives us great scalability to our networks to make sure that you have the services that you're looking for without having to jump through a bunch of hoops. From a multi-tenancy standpoint, we have VMware vCloud Director. 
Uh, that is our <clears throat> portal to give you your own resources and your own portal. So you log in, you see your things. You don't see anybody else's things. There's not a V center that you go see and you have to just, you know, R back your way down to your VMs. You see them in your portal as if you're the only person on the platform. Um, this also gives us the ability to do dedicated pods. So if you are a customer and you say, I don't want to share my hardware with anybody, you can get dedicated pods or you can go in, you can go into our shared pod and get, you know, higher scale, uh, that through that method. From a data protection standpoint, we have vCloud availability. So we have our, uh, this is built into the vCloud director suite. Um, we can provide migration and data protection across our data centers through vCloud availability. Uh, I actually set this up uh, in our lab from my uh, home lab to our lab, and it took me about 15 minutes to set it up. It's super simple and it works great. Uh, additionally, we have Zerto and Cohesity for uh, disaster recovery options and, and data protection options. So if you have different options, you're a Zerto customer, these are also options for you. And from, an op from a performance management uh, level, we have our vRealize operations and vRealize log insight. So all these same tool sets that, we're, that you're running on premises, or even if you're not running on premises, you now have access to these. Um, it's a way for you to start to build out an enterprise level uh, platform without having to buy enterprise level software and hardware. These pods are built on top of Dell PowerEdge hardware. So it's enterprise class hardware with enterprise class support. Again, you're buying and utilizing a piece of it, so you're getting all the benefits without having to put up all the upfront costs. We've done that. Um, you have 25 gig leaf switches from Arista and 40 gig spine switches from Juniper, so you have a ton of east-west throughput along with that 100 gig backbone. So you have a ton of network capability, again, without having to buy that whole network. Our pod has just about two petabytes of disk in it and 37 terabytes of RAM, so we're able to scale up and also we're capable of scaling out. So we're able to add nodes to these pods to be able to give you the, the scale that you and your applications are looking for. Everything coming through one portal, all being uh, consumed uh, through a resource pool. So you have this super big, you have this really nice flexibility without having to go all the way out to a hyperscale cloud. From a security standpoint, all of the disk is encrypted. We have all of the, uh, we can do VPN tunnels from our uh, data centers to your sites. You can also do your own individual circuits. So there's no going over the internet and publicly you know, broadcasting that traffic. You can get directly to us. Um, all of the storage is all flash. So you have all the performance you're looking for as well. Uh, and we're working on our next generation of that hardware to make it even faster. So what makes an application a good fit? for enterprise cloud. <clears throat> if it existed two years ago, if it runs in a VM or physical hardware, if it's always on or if it fails, if the hardware fails, that's a great fit for enterprise cloud. This is usually where um, your applications have been, right? This is the application that's been running your, re your retail site or your billing system or your HR system. It's not going anywhere. That application isn't changing. Um, so if you want to bring that over to a cloud and know exactly what you're going to get out of that, that's what works for you. If it has a low value created through application refactoring, there is very little reason to take it to a hyperscale cloud. Um, if your application generates $100,000 in revenue, but it would cost you a million dollars to rewrite it, there, there's not a really great value proposition in trying to move that to a hyperscale cloud and refactor it so it fits properly. And let's be really honest, mainframe, iSeries, HP UX, those things are not dying. <laughs> uh, for the customers who ha still have mainframes and still have AIX, they're not going anywhere. Um, so if you interact with those physical systems, again, we're still a colo provider. So you can bring your mainframe, put it right next to EEC and put it right next to our container platforms and start to build that past, present and future together. Or if you, maybe you have an existing security stack, you really like your physical firewalls, you can also bring those to the table, bring those into our data center and run your VMs through them. So that's a really great, great place for enterprise cloud as a test drive. If you wanna do a test drive of EEC, you can absolutely set one of those up with me, uh, aj.kuftik at expedient.com, uh, at ajkuftik on Twitter, slash in slash ajkuftik. Um, we have a really great platform. We think it fits a lot of use cases. Uh, and Julie, I think we can uh, open it up for questions now. 
Uh, I see the first one here. Are there plans to offer the service to cloud providers in Canada? Um, so from a Canadian standpoint, we can bring those to, um, we can bring it to customer sites. So we do have a customer in Canada right now that's using our enterprise cloud. Um, so they have it as a dedicated node in their environment. Um, so if you want to bring this to places that are not inside of the US, uh, we can absolutely do that. And there, there's you know, obviously more discussions uh, to be had there. We charge per VM, um, per gig of RAM and per, store, per gig of storage used. So it's based on the resources that you're using. There's no, um, we build a, a total pool based off of that. So if you need you know, 500 gigs of RAM, you pay for those 500 gigs of RAM and the terabyte of storage. Um, but that's the total cost for the VM. That includes all the licensing, all the hardware costs, all the storage, everything is included in those costs. So it's a, <clears throat> plus all of our services. So our delivery services and operational services. Uh, we have a 24 by seven help desk uh, that is available by phone. When you call them, they answer the phone. There's no phone tree. Um, and so all of that is included in those, in those services. Um, Looking for any other questions. Hi, Paul. Paul says hi. Hi, Paul. Anyone have any other questions? We are a current DR as a service customer. Do we have access to access? Do we have access to access and monitor the edge firewall? Um, you can enable logging. Uh, so if you're a DR as a service customer, there's there are ways to do that inside of EEC. Uh, so uh, inside of there was the ability to enable logging uh, per rule uh, and then get access to those logs through Log Insight. So there's there are ways to go do that monitoring. Is there a calculator to compare to Azure or AWS? Uh, on our website, we have a cloud cost calculator. Um, so you can go look at that and we are working on a newer version right now to uh, do uh, more of a direct comparison, but you can go look at your cost to run your VMs in a cloud through our cloud calculator. Do you have Linux VMs? Yes, uh, we have plenty of Linux VMs. Uh, I actually just deployed one in our demo environment yesterday. So uh, we fully support Windows VMs and Linux. Um, I just don't think that our uh, templates were available. I don't have the Ubuntu templates pointed at ours. Um, but yes, you have Linux templates. You can bring your own templates. You can bring your own images. Um, so there's a number of different options there. Um, our container platform is all based on Ubuntu. So yes, we do we do have Linux VMs and support them. Do we have the ability to manage our edge firewall, including VPN configurations ourselves? Uh, I believe so, yes. Um, we have different VPN uh, capabilities. So we use uh, Pulse Secure for our VPN. So you can set up a larger VPN tunnel from your site uh, to here. We had a number of customers you know, as part of all the uh, coronavirus and COVID uh, work that had to be done when the quarantine started uh, increase their VPN tunnels. Um, but we have additional VPN, additional VPN configurations inside of EEC that are available. Do we have a cloud shell? Um, not entirely. So I'm guessing you're trying to compare that to like an Azure cloud shell or a Google cloud shell. Um, no, we have a full API uh, through, let me get that up. So if I go to api docs.expedient.cloud, 
Uh, we have our full API documentation here. So we have uh, the capability to do full APIs. Uh, there's also the, um, the cloud power CLI uh, commandlets are also available and can connect to uh, vCloud Director, which is what runs EDC, and you can do all of those sorts of things. So you have some shell capabilities, um, but not a direct shell to, to open up. Uh, the VSRX devices are part of the platform, Harry. So uh, I would have to uh, ask one of our essays uh, to talk through the, uh, VS, the VSRX devices and what capabilities you guys have there. We generally manage the VSRX uh, clusters themselves. Yes, we have a uh, API base URL and endpoints. So if you go to, uh, if you're a customer and you go to API or expedient.cloud slash API, that is the front end API for EEC. Uh, from there, you have to uh, point your commands at um, the actual organization. So when it, that, there's a, the Terraform provider as well for vCloud Director, you can use that with VCD. In fact, if you wanna see more about that, we'll be doing that on uh, Thursday as part of a demo, uh, 1230 Eastern. Um, but yes, we have an API endpoint for uh, our cloud. So if you want to go stand up vApps, turn them on, turn them off, delete them, maybe any of these sorts of uh, commands and uses, um, you're capable of doing that. This is what we've set up uh, this is a Postman instance, so if you click uh, at the top run in Postman, it downloads the whole collection, downloads all the environment variables, so you can start to deliver that API-driven interface uh, as part of that um, without having to uh, completely rewrite everything. Um, but yes, we have those, those base URL and endpoints. Is macOS supported when accessing a vColo? Um, yes. So if I go into our vColo, um, should be. Yeah, vColo is uh, a, a, the predecessor to EEC. Uh, you should be able to go in with Mac OS and be able to get to vColo and access vCenter the same way that you would do on a Windows machine. Um, do we use OR? That one I'm not sure about. I'm honestly not sure on that one, Paul. I would have to go do some research for you on OAuth 2. Generally, users will create an API account um, and that's their uh, API interface, or they log in with their own account and set their uh, passwords in uh, an a, variable uh, bleh, a variable file with Terraform or uh, store them inside of something like Postman. One of the things I actually really like about um, the uh, API system is that it, we can generate it in PowerShell and use REST methods instead of trying to deliver uh, the vCloud or the Power CLI stuff. So if you want to just go do the API commands, this is how it looks in PowerShell. You can change the language and look at other things. So it's actually really helpful from a um, and from that environment. Are we competing in the same space as Azure, AWS, IBM, and GCP? Um, yes. Uh, we compete in their IaaS space. Uh, we're competing less in their um, platform as a service space. Uh, that's largely due to the fact that they have, uh, they've built a lot of those platforms for themselves and are uh, making them available to others, like uh, Google Cloud Provider opening up GKE. Uh, that was Borg. So AWS, again, all of their EC2 instances and S3 buckets, um, all of these things were built for themselves and they make them into services. We're competing in the IaaS space, but the enterprise cloud space is different. Um, we're focused on helping enterprises get to get their applications into a cloud space without having to completely rewrite or refactor them, uh, which the, you know, the hyperscalers like AWS and Azure do. Um, so there's application clouds and enterprise clouds or hyperscale and enterprise, hyperscale and application clouds. Um, 
they're focused entirely on applications. They want you to not think about the infrastructure at all on the bottom. Uh, and their preference would be for you to use their platforms as a service, things like RDS or um, data lakes or Google BigQuery, um, those sorts of things, instead of you running your own individual VMs and managing them. Um, so there's, there's different spaces there. We offer we offer what we offer their pieces. Uh, we offer their infrastructure as a service piece. Um, I as infrastructure as a service. So we offer our storage, VMs, networks. Um, but in terms of offering similar platforms, like we don't offer a satellite control system like AWS does. Uh, any bare metal or just uh, hybrid cloud and colo? Um, I'm trying to think if we've done any sort of bare metal. Um, yes, we've done we've done bare metal. Uh, we can buy servers and put operating systems on them. So if you want to do bare metal that way, uh, we also have our private vcolo. So if you have a um, if you want to do things like say VDI, um, VDI requires direct access to vCenter, whether that's Citrix or Horizon. So uh, we offer that as a way for you to build your own managed VDI platform. You still have to manage the VDI, the brokers, the desktops, that sort of thing, but we can still provide the infrastructure on the back end. Um, so we have that plus Colo, so you can put all of that together. Is the Canadian company you're servicing one of your US sites uh, some other site in Canada. No, they are. They have their services are on prem for them. So they we can go on prem as well. We offer our uh, private cloud on our on prem private cloud, so we can have that and present that up with DR as a service to one of our US sites. So um, this allows us to go into basically put our pod wherever we want to um, and start to build those services going north from there. One of the things that we offer as part of EEC and as part of our overall platform is a 100% SLA. Um, that's a full stop. There's no five nines, there's no six nines, there's no, you know, we can wiggle out of 30 seconds. Our SLA is 100%, so you can line that up to uh, your business without having to figure out, you know, whether or not this is going to work or not. Um, one of the big challenges that we have with hyperscale is um, you have to make sure that your storage is the correct type of storage. Not all the storage and some of the cloud providers have that individual level of SLA. Um, so we offer that across all of our services. If our, if our services to you are down, there's a credit involved. Uh, this gives us uh, a big leg up in terms of our customer base looking at us and saying, we know that it's going to work. Um, and we, we stand behind that. <laughs> We've stood behind it a number of times. So that 100% SLA goes a long way uh, in terms of supporting uh, our customers. Just want to throw that out there.
So I want to thank uh, everybody for attending. Uh, Julie, is there any other housekeeping things that you want to mention before we wrap up here? Yes, I, well, I'd like to thank you, AJ, for taking the time to speak to us today and remind our attendees that they will receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. To find out more about the VMUG webcast program, visit vmug.com and check out the education page. And please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webcast and let us know how today's session went. And from all of us here at VMUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day.